Hey, George, are you there? John, hi, how are you? I'm pretty good. Good, is good. Strong. It's been a month, I think, at least. Yes. I just said that uh, spring has sprung. I'm actually wearing shorts today. Let me see if I can <laughs> really? give, give Blinding Heads people a shot. Yes. Oh, we had a, a this cold snap. This big cold front moved in, and it was supposed to get down to, like, 27 last night. Oh, really? Jeez. Yeah, I think it did. So we've had, uh, yeah, some freezing weather in May, which is pretty unusual. Yeah, we went through a period like that where we had these little tantalizing uh, kind of warm spells followed by days of brutal cold in April. Yeah. It was really, uh, it was driving me crazy, but it's it's beautiful now. All the flowers are out. Yeah. My street is lined with all these trees that are in full bloom now. And, oh, that sounds and, great. Um, yeah, it is great. There's some that are really sweet, and then uh, there's one kind of tree, I'm not sure what it is. It smells like... Um, rotten fruit it's it's kind of disgusting but i love it because it's associated with uh with springtime and the end of school for me oh okay yeah we don't have those here yeah I should, <laughs> we, we do I have should. apricot trees and they were you we had nice apricot blossoms and then some of them froze with an earlier cold snap but um I mean, now today it's clear, the sky's blue, it's sunny, but it's cold. But unfortunately, it's still bone dry. The drought here is just, it's just gotten worse every year. And, you know, normally in March and into early April, you have to shovel snow every few days. You get these big, big wet snows that melt really quickly and soak into the ground. And it's really great because then it's bone dry until, like, mid-July when you get the summer monsoons, but this time we didn't get that spring moisture, and we really didn't get it last year, and then last year we didn't really have much of a rainy season either, so. Do people, what's, what's the consensus? Is, is uh, this dry spell going to be the new normal? Well, that's what people say, and, you know, of course they don't really know. Yeah. But I look back at the old rainfall records, and, uh, like when I first moved here in the early 90s, we were, you know, mo most years you were getting uh, 12 inches during the year of precipitation, and, and now we're lucky to get eight, and I don't even know what it was last year, but it's like we're getting the same precipitation that Albuquerque to the south used to get, and then, you know, they're turning into like El Paso, so, yeah, I don't know. Scary. Bad, know. bad for maybe... fires. Maybe everybody should just start moving out of the southwest. Maybe. The time has come. <laughs> in that case, <laughs> I'll stay. Where I live. In that case, I'll stay. I think it would be an improvement. <laughs> but, uh, anyway. That's right. The more people leave, the more incentive there is to stay. Kind of an interesting uh, yeah. mathematical situation there. I guess it would lead to paralysis. <laughs> um, well, so listen, I, I've got something I have to get off my chest. Yeah, please and do. And it's it's not um, it's not very sciencey. It's the kind of thing that I uh, I post on my Scientific American blog and oh, well, everything and, comes and, down to science at the at the bottom most level. Well, I I think everything is analyzable scientifically, empirically, or at least logically, including warfare. Yes. Uh, but often when I write about war at Scientific American. Um, and spout my usual lefty peacenik drivel, uh, people say, what is this crap doing at Scientific American? Oh. Oh, save it for the nation, you you pinko. Oh, you had a really great post, though, that, uh, on, on Boston versus uh, American uh, warfare with drones. I thought that was really, it really made me think. Well, thank you, George. So I'll just... Talk about I'll that, yeah. People, yeah, I'll tell people a little bit about it. So... Um, Actually, before the Boston bombing, um, I had been thinking of writing about a, um, an incident that took place in Afghanistan that really bothered me. Mm -hmm. And it bothered me in part because it's, it's not all that unusual. It was uh, an American airstrike to take out a Taliban leader right near the, the border oh, of Afghanistan yes. and Pakistan. And, uh, you know, the details are a little murky, as they tend to be in yeah. these cases. But, but um, uh, at least 10 children were killed 
uh-huh. in the yeah. uh, airstrike, and uh, five women were uh, severely injured. And it looks like you know we got the the uh, alleged bad guy as well. But um, these these American uh, these American operations that end up killing civilians really sicken me. They really bother me. Yeah. It's, it's you know the focus is on drones, but these kinds of civilian casualties can come out and yeah. come about in a bunch of different ways. So then we had the Boston Marathon bomb, right. and horrible. which was horrible and yeah. you know really uh, shocking. And of course, I like everybody else wondered who the hell could have done something uh, so malicious and senseless. And then I started thinking about um, how my own country uh, routinely unfortunately, ends up killing civilians. And now the, uh, the death toll is uh, in the tens of thousands. If you look at Pakistan, Afghanistan, uh, and Iraq, mm-hmm. and Iraq, and yeah. that's tens of thousands is actually pretty conservative. Yeah. Now, there is a gigantic moral difference, right. at least on the surface, between civilian deaths caused by American military operations and um, the terrorist bombing in Boston. Well, yeah, that was it was intentionally designed right. to kill civilians and therefore to terrorize the population, which seems as good a definition of terrorism as anything. That's right, and you know, I I talk in um, in one of my classes. We go through moral theory. We talk about Kant's uh, discussion of morality and his mm-hmm. focus on intention as um, the most important uh, factor for judging whether an act is right or wrong, more yeah. than actually the consequences of the act. And more intention, than. of course, is yeah. how we distinguish murder from manslaughter, and I, I totally get that. But the problem I have when trying to apply that standard to um, American uh, killing of civilians is that... Um, we do it so routinely. We've been doing it for such a long time now, and in some cases, we we kill someone knowing that civilians will be killed. So yeah. there was a discussion of some of the the drone strikes uh, by Barack Obama um, in the New York Times. This is a couple of years ago, or maybe a year ago or so, that uh, said that in some cases Obama was personally approving strikes where he knew that civilians were present and going to be killed, but it was decided that that was worthwhile to get this uh, right. high-profile target. Um, in other cases, Obama said it ruled against a strike because it wasn't deemed to be worth the, uh, the civilian cost. Yeah, so um, you get this calculus that gets into these gradations between intentionality and uh, accidental death, and that's when it really gets it's messy and makes you wonder if you shouldn't just not do it. Well, this, so I remember, I started thinking about this quite a while ago because I heard, I heard um, Noam Chomsky talking about um, you know, American military mm-hmm. policy and just war and so forth. And Chomsky yeah. said, you know, ultimately intentions don't matter or intentions are, you know, what is really in the heart of, American military planners when they're carrying out some big operation to the dead people. No, it doesn't matter to the victims and to their families. The the people who love the dead people, it doesn't fucking matter what the Americans think. When they see the body count consistently rising, and my the way I feel about it, I actually think about how I try to deal with my own kids when I'm I'm telling them not to do something. So you know, I give them a couple of breaks if they're, I'm not going to go into the details, they're doing something I think is really wrong. If they keep doing something repeatedly and they keep apologizing <laughs> yeah, to me yeah. for doing it, which um, we often do, Americans yeah, yeah, often we, apologize humans. for some of these civilian deaths, what the hell do, in, do our so-called intentions and apologies matter? Yeah. At some point they become meaningless. And so... This was what I wrote. I wrote this piece. The title of it was um, How Can We Condemn the Boston Murders and Excuse U.S. Bombing of Civilians, mm-hmm. which, which 
which, uh, you know, I was trying to, to uh, pose this question in, in the starkest possible terms, and I worried about writing it because I, I felt that it's, um, you know, I, I am, in a way, equating our actions with terrorist actions, and uh, I thought I'd get some real blowback, and I did, but what was interesting is that I got a, an overwhelming response from people, many of whom emailed me uh, personally, who said that they had been thinking the same thing after the Boston bombings. Ah, interesting. And it had really bothered them, but they didn't want to say it out loud. Yeah. And so I got a lot of people thanking me for having expressed this idea, and, um, and you know, that made me think that there's also something wrong with our country if we're not allowed to have a, a more candid discussion about about the morality of some of our military operations. Yeah, or not allowing ourselves. Right. But um, self censorship. Yeah. Well, yeah, and then just the whole issue of a country like setting a moral standard above anyone else. I mean, I think that has right. huge positive, long term effects that aren't. You know, really easy to to delineate, but um, yeah, yeah, George. That for me, okay. You can look at it as a moral issue, but it's sometimes the morality bleeds over into just strictly practical issues. So, yeah. just looking at this in practical terms, and, and as a pro public relations problem, um, a lot of people. Uh, see us as terrible hypocrites in the way that we condemn uh, terrorist bombings or even the actions of somebody like Assad in Syria when we are responsible so, for, so, uh, for so many uh, civilian deaths. And again, yeah. it's not an exact um, uh, analogy between, no. it's definitely not, between us and what somebody no. like Assad is doing. But uh, but there is some overlap, and, and in terms of, in practical terms, we should be holding ourselves to an extremely high standard so we can't be accused of hypocrisy, and so we make it harder for other people around the world to justify their brutality. Yeah, I basically agree, and of course the, you know, the counter argument, or at least question to that, is what, what would that cost us in terms of our own um, casualties and not eliminating, you know, possible threats against the American civilization, the, the American civilian population. So right, yeah, I, it is. I, it's it's it's, it's very Just, difficult. But I, I feel as though this is what the State Department and the Pentagon should be all over. Yeah, uh, that yeah. you know they they have billions of dollars given to them to deal with it deal with these sorts of problems yeah. about perception versus reality and short-term gain versus long-term costs of some of our military policies. And, and, and it's becoming, um, yeah, just, yeah, I'm sorry, I didn't mean to overstep no, your words. Yeah, so, anyway. Yeah, um, I mean, yeah, it's becoming so, um, you, know, uh, you know, almost routine and habitual and, and just uh, kind of taken for granted that this is part of, part of strategy, you know, so you have the moral agonizing, you uh, do this calculus of whether, you know, it's worth the innocent people who are going to be killed, and you decide whether or not to do it, but, you know, you still continue to do it under, under many, many circumstances. Like, you know, we have no way of knowing if it's most or, or what the proportion is, and yeah, it just becomes I, you know, the you know the norm, which is which is really terrifying. And yeah, people say that well, you know, the terrorists pose a uh, this terrible threat to us, but um, you know, is it an existential threat? Is it is the the fate of the United States really hanging in the balance yeah. here, the way it arguably was when we faced I don't know Nazi Germany, let's say yeah. Nazi Germany. Uh, the decision was made that we were justified in bombing civilian populations. The same decision was made um, when it came to dropping atomic bombs right. on Hiroshima and Nagasaki. Right. I disagree with those decisions, 
but I can see the logic much more than I can see the logic, again, just in practical terms, about, um, about bombing with lots of collateral damage yeah. in uh, these faraway places against these ragtag armies like the Taliban and yeah. Al-Qaeda. Well, then there's the argument, too, that, that, that Robert Wright's made, made so many times about the whole zero-sum you know, way of thinking that uh, you know, we're really just inviting you know, by by those kinds of actions, we're inviting retaliation, even if it's just lone wolves like the like the uh, two guys in Boston. Right. You know, they they justify to themselves. You know, they're saying, "Well, look what the United States is doing to civilians," and you know, and then you mix that in with radical Islam, and it just gives you you know one more one more reason to. You know, just have this intense hatred that results in, in killing people at a, at a, at a Sunday ra foot race. Yeah, and there was, I mean, you know, there's this kind of philosophical debate or, or uh, uh, people hypothesizing over whether our actions actually create more, more enemies than they eliminate of the yeah. United States. Yeah, I mean, you don't know. There's just a, there's just a big report... Uh, within the last six months or so by NYU and Stanford about U.S. Uh, drone attacks that did present some empirical data suggesting mm. that uh, the, uh, the, net, um, the net effect of our drone strikes is, drone strikes is negative. Wow. We are creating more enemies, more bad will, more destabilization in some of these uh, places, especially Pakistan and Afghanistan. That's interesting. Um, then we're gaining from these strikes. So. I, mean, I can't imagine how you quantify that, but yeah, you know, it's, it's one of those things that rings rings true. It just seems naturally that it would do that. But yeah, yeah, I don't know. Anyway, you, okay. Thanks for letting me. Uh, no, that was good. I mean, you 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 have a much more articulated position on this than I do, and you thought about it a lot, and it's an important part of your your, your book. Um, yeah, you know, the funny thing is, I, I feel I, the way that I pitched my book, The End of War, originally was war is a, we should think of war as a scientific problem that can be analyzed empirically and we can come up with solutions. And, mm -hmm. and I'm beginning to think that that was really a mistake. I do think there's a lot we can learn about, about war by analyzing it. And and looking at the history of war and even war in pre-state societies and so forth. And especially, uh, we need to dispel, based on this kind of analysis, some of the really bad theories of war, like biological theories of war, and, uh, no, theories war. that attribute war just to resource scarcity. But ultimately, it's moral. It's a, it's, it, it requires a moral realization that, that war is just uh, beyond the pale. Yeah. You know that that and I'm I'm struggling to find the rhetoric to get people to see war the way I do. And I figure, you know, killing babies. I actually had posted a picture of these lined up little uh, Afghan babies that were killed by this recent U.S. strike. Mm -hmm. Can't we all agree that that is wrong? Yeah. And um, and that therefore. Uh, these actions that are sanctioned by our great nation are wrong, and we must seek a way to stop doing these things once and for all. Yeah. Um, anyway, okay. Uh, <laughs> so, um, you've been writing some really cool stuff lately. Oh! Oh, on the blog, right. Yeah, I mean, everything else I've been writing hasn't seen the light of day yet because it's still in the publication pipeline. But, yeah, I've been doing doing a blog post a couple times a week or so, sometimes just once a week. But, um, mm -hmm. yeah, and then lately I have got really interested in, uh, well, actually, for random reasons, I, I started thinking about Horace Freeland Judson's book, um, The Eighth Day of Creation, about the whole, uh, the whole history of, of the um, discovery that nucleic acid was the uh, genetic material, and, and then you know, leading up to Watson and Crick's uh, elucidation of the um, the uh, double helical structure of DNA and how the structure so beautifully 
explained its function, and then on through, you know, the breaking of the genetic code, etc. And, you know, it's my, it's my absolute, to, to me it's like, uh, the post that I wrote was called the, the, the best science book ever written, and just writing kind of an appreciation of that book. And, and it happened to coincide with the uh, 60th anniversary of Watson and Crick's famous paper, which was uh, 1953. Mm-hmm. April 25th, 1953, it turns out. So, uh, you know, that gave me kind of a kind of an occasion to write about this stuff. And that led me back into remembering when I first read that book, you know, which to me it was like, you know, one of two or three books, maybe foremost among them, that really kind of inspired me to want to uh, write about science and to write books about science when I just saw what it was possible for someone like, Judson to do. And there's this section that's just always stuck in my mind where he's just really cutting back and forth between Rosalind Franklin, you know, down in London at King's College and Crick and Watson up at the Cavendish Lab in Cambridge while they're both working on the structure of nucleic acid and just gets into the whole, I mean, that's what I, when I read this book, which I think it was published in 1979, and I probably read it in the early 80s. Well, no, actually, I read it when it was serialized in the New Yorker, so I read it in the late 70s. And um, it just, to me, just really captured the whole controversy, the Rosalind Franklin controversy. It just showed step by step by looking at her journals what she was thinking at the same time what, what that Watson was thinking this and Crick was thinking that. and and Linus Pauling over in the United States at Pasadena was was thinking something else, and um, it's just fascinating. So you'll see, you know, at one point, you're really getting toward the end, and Linus Pauling is uh, working away on his uh, triple helix model uh-huh. <laughs> of DNA, and, and uh, Watson and Crick have already kind of been up that cul-de-sac and, and abandoned triple helix, and they're looking at double helix, and and Rosalind Franklin gets tantalizingly close to double helix, but she's still not sure it's a helix at all for really interesting reasons having to do with her X-ray crystallographs, and then decides, not decides, but becomes fixated on the idea that the structure is like a figure eight. <laughs> it's just, you see how close she gets, and then back and forth, and of course then the whole issue of Watson seeing her X-ray crystallograph of DNA and looking at the pattern and, and thinking, you know, helix, helix, and um, and then you know seeing it without her permission and then without actually telling her that he'd seen it. How did you feel? I mean, you know, so there has there have been, I think, plays and books. Oh yeah, about yeah. Rosalind two, Franklin. Two biographies. So many articles. Franklin. What's your takeaway about whether? She deserved a, a, a Nobel Prize, uh, or at least more credit, was unfairly treated, all that sort of mm, stuff. Definitely deserved more credit, although I think a lot of people would be surprised if they went back at, and, and looked at uh, Watson and Crick's paper, and they see that uh, they do uh, credit her and, and, and Wilkins, her, her, her partner, and, you know, <laughs> you know uh, sparring, I, I not even that, I mean, you know, she and Wilkins were really really, really at odds all the time for various reasons. But anyway, she supposedly worked with Wilkins at King's. But, um, but uh, you, you know, they do, they do acknowledge, you know, the, the work and, and the way, but, but they don't acknowledge it as explicitly as a lot of people think they should. They don't directly talk about the photograph, uh, of the x-ray crystallographic photo. And, and I think there's a strong argument that, you know, since that was so important in helping them, um, you know, finally click on to the double helical structure, that um, she should have been invited to be a co-author on the paper. I think there's a strong argument for that. Then again, it's not clear to me that she wouldn't have just, just spurned them because there was, you know, really bad blood between the two labs, and she really kind of denigrated their whole approach to model building before you know, she was trying to get the structure as much as possible from the ground up, you know, um, inductively instead of deductively, uh, you know, and then she was just getting to the point of model building 
with her figure eight structure. So um, she definitely deserved more credit. On the Nobel Prize, I mean, I think Watson and Crick deserve, you know, there's just no question that, that far and away above anyone, they deserved the Nobel Prize. And the question is who the third person should have been if Franklin had lived um, long enough. You know, she, was, she had died of cancer before the award was, uh, was granted. And the third person they included was Maurice Wilkins. And, mm -hmm. and I think it's pretty clear to anyone reading the history that, that if Franklin had been alive, and since they traditionally don't give a Nobel to more than three people, that it would have been, should have been uh, Watson, Crick, and Franklin rather than, rather than Wilkins. Yeah. But the other um, question is whether she, I mean, even Crick himself, I guess, has said that he thought given a few more months, knowing what, what he knows, that she would have gotten the structure. And then, and then um, she was just a very different kind of thinker, you know, bottom, build up from the bottom instead of, you know, uh, deduce things from, you know. I, I think Watson and Crick kind of embodied that style where you go back and forth between the two levels, bottom up and top down, and converge on this this model. And her strong feeling was that you you know you can build a you can build any kind of models. You can build hundreds of different models of DNA, but how are you really going to know that yours is not only consistent with the data, but that it's necessary and that it's the only one? And that's where she yeah. didn't think the double helix had it. Until later, though, once she saw the model, she immediately realized, my God, this is right. And then she was able to go back and look at the x-ray crystallographs more closely. And finally, after the Watson and Crick paper, um, you know, she and, uh, and uh, her partner, was it uh, Gossman, um, you know, d d did a paper that really kind of nailed it with the DNA data. So you knew that... Uh, you know, it was it was even it made it even more solid. Before it was beautiful and semi solid, and then it was beautiful and solid. So, I think she's very was very very underestimated, and I think that's taken a long time to change, but that it is changing. But unfortunately, no. a lot of it after she'd already died. So, so you had um, you had uh, a post also not only on Judson's book. Um, but also on um, this uh, letter from Crick that you had. I mean, I guess. Oh, you were, uh, yeah, right. When I thought I might want to write his uh, biography, it was after I'd written the biography of Murray Gelman, mm -hmm. and I got a call or an email from uh, this guy, uh, Al Seckel, who's a rare scientific book dealer in Los Angeles or Pasadena. And he was friends with Murray, and he loved my biography, and he was friends with Crick, and, and he was trying to convince me, and to some extent to help convince Crick that I should write Crick's uh, biography. Mm -hmm. And I thought, well, you know, I wasn't sure I wanted to leap into, you know, Strange Beauty took like almost, it was like four to five year project. You know, not full time, I did other things, but still a huge project. And... Um, I wasn't sure I wanted to take that on. And again, you know, Murray wasn't cooperative, and, and I didn't think Crick would be cooperative. And then it was clear how uncooperative he was going to be when I got this, this letter from him. So, yeah, so, um, I, and I, I, I put an image of that on the blog, along with this famous postcard that Crick used to send people that had boxes that he would check, that, you know, I'm sorry, but Dr. Crick is not able to, you know, you know, then you check, you know, review your paper, uh, uh, give you advice on your career, hear about your wonderful new discovery, uh, cure your disease, you know, very, very quick, cynical kind of uh, brush off postcard. So I was happy not to get that. But uh, Well, you know, it. so when you describe your letter, it made me think, because I, um, I, went out to the Salk Institute and spent an afternoon hanging out with, uh, with Crick in, um, in 1991 yeah. and then uh, wrote a profile of him right. in Scientific American that was published in February um, 1992. And I vaguely recall having some correspondence with him. And I, uh, I, and I talked to him over the phone a few times for uh, fact-checking the piece 
And then I, I interviewed him uh, several times after that about um, his work on consciousness. Right. And, uh, and I even had lunch with him and a bunch of other people in, um, I don't know, 99 or so. Yeah. Um, again, uh, near the Slock Institute. And I thought, gee, do I have a, a letter from uh, Crick? And I went into my files, and I found one. Here it is. Great. I'm holding it up. And uh, it's basically, uh, it's about the profile I wrote about him. And he says, thank you very much for the lively profile of me in the February issue. It's difficult for me to judge it dispassionately, but Odile, his wife, likes it, and I suspect many others will. Then he corrects me on a few things. <laughs> uh, there are a few tiny slips, and one of them is, you know, it's bad. I, I, um, I talked about uh, his... Um, directed panspermia theory and said that it came from um, his book Life Itself, which he co-wrote with Leslie Orgel, and that's a, a dumb mistake. Um, Crick wrote that book himself. He and Orgel had written a book, I mean, a paper on uh, directed panspermia ah, see, but together. Not the book. Yeah. Um, but then here's what's relevant to uh, our discussion. Um, uh, he says... Um, you know, he talks a little bit about uh, DNA. He actually says he was only faintly attached to the University of, uh, of Cambridge. He never lectured there. His money came from the British Medical Research Council, blah, blah, blah. Oh, yeah. And then he says, um, it was a pity that you did not mention Rosalind Franklin as well as wow. uh, Maurice Wilkins in the profile. Yeah. So, uh, that's great. God, maybe you can auction that. You know, that was, <laughs> that, that was another one of the, that was another one of the pegs for my blog posts was uh, Crick's relatives are auctioning off his, some of his stuff, like his Nobel medal and this famous letter he wrote to his son. So, so this maybe that would go on the first auction. First person who offers me a hundred thousand bucks gets this letter. Signed Francis. At the very end, I, the title of my piece was called the Mephistopheles of neurobiology, because <laughs> Crick, did you ever meet him? Yeah, oh yeah. Well, so, if you remember, he had a very red face, and he had these eyebrows that came up like... Oh, they're voice. amazing, yeah, those, yeah, those wonderful Scottish eyebrows. <laughs> right, and so, uh, and I called him Mephistopheles, and at the end of his letter here, he says... Um, uh, I only hope my colleagues will not start addressing me as meth. <laughs> Short for meth That's a great me. letter. That's much better than my letter. I think, I don't know, you should, you know, you'd probably take less than 100000 I would venture. <laughs> Listen, I, I need all the help I can to get my kids through uh, college. Uh, I have no sentimental attachment to books and documents. Um, that could so do it. I don't know. Maybe I'll post <laughs> it on e eBay. Now, the only thing is that it says right here, not for publication. Does, yeah, I don't know your, how that works. Does your letter say not for publication? No, but, but it's, nothing that, it, it's nothing that was quotable and it didn't arise from me writing something about it. Right. You know, one um, of my strongest memories of Crick was... There was this small meeting in, in Cambridge that I went to. It was called How the Brain Works or something like this in the early 90s, I would guess it was, or late 80s. And it was at that, that round, tubular Howard Johnson's on, you know, it's right on the, um, the river there, kind of between Harvard and MIT. And Crick was at the conference along with a lot of other people, you know, working on consciousness and brain stuff. And he gave this talk, and at one point he was lamenting, you know, or thinking wistfully of how much further we'd be in understanding the human brain if neuroscientists were allowed to experiment on prisoners. <laughs> That's classic. I mean, that to me is classic Crick. And, but it's great to see him making a point of... of uh, of, of drawing attention and chiding you about Rosalind Franklin. And he, he and Franklin apparently got along. Yeah, I mean, it, it, she got along with almost anybody better than she got along with uh, Watson or, or Wilkins, although she was apparently not such an easy person to get along with, mm -hmm. but, uh, you know, which is no excuse for anything. But, but then there was this interesting exchange between Crick 
and you know basically with Franklin it turned the, the the problem turned on uh, there being two forms of uh, DNA but she really clearly demonstrated with her with her x-ray crystallographs you know and these are images where they you know basically bounce x-rays off the uh, off molecules and from these patterns you can decipher the structure although it's you know, there's nothing straightforward about it like you look at her famous uh, photograph 51 and then and then you read Judson describing how it sh absolutely shouts helix and uh, you go oh <laughs> but yeah but it, it has a symmetry to it like a Maltese cross it was described but uh, but then you have this other, and that turned out to have been DNA when it was hydrated or, or, or wet DNA that had water combined with the molecule. And when you had crystallized, uh, drier uh, DNA, then, then the structure looked very different in the crystallograph. And, and, uh, and Franklin apparently agreed that, that image B, the one that Watson later, later saw, uh, was you know you know was helical, but you couldn't figure out how that could be helical if the other one didn't look helical. And Crick was trying to convince her that it might well be helical. It's just that you know when it's in crystallized form, you're going to get a more you know complex compressed image. Mm -hmm. And I'm not sure how much you know, you know that he thought thought that through to that point. And that's later what she found after after uh, the Watson and Crick paper that. That if you once you knew that it was a double helix, you could go back and find the double helix in the uh, crystallized photograph, photograph A, which is kind of interesting. You know, one of these things where you where you can't see the answer in the data until you have the answer from somewhere else. But she was being very, very, very cautious, and they were not being nearly so cautious. And in that case, their uh, lesser caution paid off. I just have to, I want to read something from this profile mm -hmm. of Crick uh, that seems relevant to this. He's, he talks, Crick is talking about how uh, almost infinitely complex the brain uh, seemed to be. He's, right, he's talking in the early 90s, and listen, he could be talking today still, and how they have these theories and they test them out and they turn out not to be true or maybe they're only partially uh, corroborated. Uh, he says, he and Watson only deciphered the dub double helix after numerous false starts. And then this is a quote, exploratory research is really like working in a fog. You're just groping. Then mm. people learn about it afterwards and think how straightforward it was. Um, That's so great. He's, he's describing exactly what you're talking about. And, you know, I feel, I mean, I've given a lot of scientists a, a hard time in the end of science I profiled some folks and said mean things about them and made fun of them and I really liked Francis Crick a lot and admired him I think I might have said to you before I, I feel as though he had the best purest scientific mind I have ever encountered because he had an enormous ego which is required for doing science at very, very high levels, mm -hmm. especially uh, very competitive science. I mean, think about Watson and Crick yeah. in this race with Linus pauling for God's yeah, sake. Yeah, right. Juggernaut, yeah. <laughs> yeah. who's chasing after the structure of, um, of DNA as well. But what the advantage that Crick had over a lot of other great scientists, and Murray Gell-Mann comes to mind, is that Crick uh, his ego never led him to become personally invested or attached to any particular theory. And it was all about the data. Yeah. And, um, and if, you know, he would have like his 40 hertz oscillation theory of consciousness that right. he and Christoph Koch developed together. And if you could show him that there are flaws in that, and there, there have been a lot of flaws, it turns out, in that theory, um, he would discard it in a moment. He could be brutal to people yeah. who had theories that he thought were based on shoddy reasoning and shoddy uh, data. But it wasn't about him showing that he was smarter than other people. He really did not give a shit about that, Yeah, I honestly think. It was all about trying to figure out how nature works. Yeah. 
and, I think and, and, and being ego, e ego maniacal in the sense that he thought he was one who could do it? Well, no, ego maniacal in the pursuit of that goal of truth and uh, not, not really caring about whose feelings got hurt. Oh, the way yeah. To get there. Yeah, as well, no, yeah, so, so not really ego maniacal then, but driven. I mean, even though I think he was ego maniacal, but. He was obsessed with the truth, but yeah, ego maniacal is maybe. maybe is maybe not uh, yeah because right. you can be obsessed with the truth and then and, 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 and be humble <laughs> right so I contrast him with another Nobel laureate who uh, won a Nobel Prize in this case in immunology and then oh. went into neuroscience that's Gerald Edelman <laughs> right Edelman who neural Edelmanism right and Edelman is I talked about Edelman Edelman in my profile of uh, of uh, Crick um, Edelman is somebody who, whose ego does get in the way, mm. I think, and he's, he was very invested in this, this kind of neural network theory right. uh, of consciousness that he started writing about. In, neural um, Darwinism, right. Yeah, in the late 80s, and I actually talked with Crick about that, and, um, and Crick uh, said that, um, uh, so I described the theory, it holds that the mind is molded by competition between groups of neurons. And at the time I interviewed Crick in 91, Errol Edelman had just moved from Rockefeller University uh, to um, an institute just down the street uh, mm -hmm. from uh, Crick. Right. Yeah. And Crick, he was talking about Edelman's theory and he said that uh, Edelman was hiding not terribly original ideas behind a, quote, smoke screen of jargon. Yeah, and then um, and I said, "Are you worried that there's going to be a clash of egos between uh, you and Edelman now that you're so close?" And Crick, um, d I say, dismiss the prospect of a confrontation. And here's what he said: "I don't regard us as rivals, but I think he does." Hmm. Yeah. And of course, neither of them came close to getting consciousness. No. Yeah. Anyway. A yeah, great... for all of the obscurities and jargon surrounding it and the extreme impenetrable nature of Edelman's writing, I, I find his theory really fascinating. Yeah, well, so others yeah. do too. Uh... But then again, yeah, you can get hung up on a theory. But then, you know, another, another interesting perspective is, is from Franklin, Rosalind Franklin's perspective. You know, Crick and Watson were getting fixated on this idea of the helix, mm -hmm. you know, while, the, while, while she didn't feel that the data was there to support it. In that case, she was wrong, and they were willing to kind of forget the fact that, uh, you know, brush aside the fact that, uh, uh, that, that image A did, didn't look helical, and that image B obviously was helical, and then just figured out, well, once you got the structure, and then once they got base pairing, that was the thing. I mean, what you can see that you know, Watson and Crick's paper came out on April 25th, <laughs> uh, 1953 is when it was published. And at that point, you know, later, and uh, Judson, I think, had access to this later, a, uh, uh, some writings of, Fra uh, private writings of Franklin came to light that show how close she was as of, like, I think, March 25th is, is the date that sticks in my mind. And she had finally moved to double helix. Mm -hmm. And, you know, a lot of people will say, well, look, you know, she was just about there. But what she didn't have was this idea of base pairing, and, you know, the complementary pairing of the bases. So you see how DNA can store an arbitrary, uh, arbitrarily infinite amount of different in information, you know, because of the different <clears throat> arrangements of bases you could have, and yet how it could have this... Uh, crystalline self-replicating structure, again, because of the complementary um, base pairing. So, hey, that, you I, know, I thought, she hadn't really come close to that, and that's what you, where you have to wonder if, if she would have come upon that in a few months, but, but uh, someone would have gotten it. But I, and another interesting point was some people argued that, well, if Watson and Crick hadn't gotten it, this might have been something where the discovery would have trickled out in bits and pieces and it wouldn't have had the same jarring impact of getting it, sort of getting it all of it, all of it at once.
it wouldn't have been the big epiphany. Yeah. Hey, hey, listen, um, in the time we have left, I think we've got to, you know, we're talking about Crick, who went from... Oh, um, brains, yeah. The greatest genetics discovery in, in, of all time, arguably, to... Um, to being a, the uh, the leader of all this new interest in the uh, the neurobiology of consciousness, right? So maybe we should talk about. I, I'm really curious to know what your thoughts are on the uh, the big new brain initiative that was just announced by um, Obama, which yeah. is a kind of parallel to another uh, billion dollar initiative that uh, is being pursued by the. Uh, European Union, and there's been a lot of right. controversy over right. whether this big science is merited or whether it's premature and that sort yeah, of thing. Yeah, the brain activity map where you're going to ultimately have a map of every neuron in the human brain and its state of activity under different different circumstances. And, but then when you go back and read what they're really talking about, you know, starting, you know, they're, they're starting with you know, very simple animal models, right? So... Mm -hmm. In a way, I mean, the way it's all, the way it's described and talked about is almost as if they were leaping in at the level that that science was at when it leapt into uh, to uh, sequencing the genome. Mm -hmm. And you know, by the time they started sequencing the genome, you know, this was decades after Watson and Crick, and right. and it was decades after uh, Minot and Jacob and Crick and deciphering the genetic code, you know, knowing right. what the triplets stood for in terms of, of uh, amino acids and protein. So all of this work had gone before that until they knew exactly, not exactly, but, you know, they, they had this, you know, they, they, they really knew as well as you could know anything how the genetic code works, how DNA replicates and all of that. And that's when they sequenced the whole thing. And then, you know, right. it's controversial you know, what's you know, come out of that in the way of medical benefits, but, you know, there's more to science than, than that. But with the brain, God, I mean, it, this would be like deciding to to sequence the genome or, or to sequence the gene, let's say, before you even knew that the gene was nucleic acid and not protein or before you even knew that information was stored in the form of, of structure and, and it just seems to me we, but just incredibly premature when I think about it like that. And um, then the other part of me says, well, how are we ever going to get this unless we just jump head first into some grand project knowing that uh, it might fail and maybe a century from now we'll be a lot closer. Yeah, it's, it's a weird, it's a weird controversy because the um, the very tentative state, you know, so if you want to use a uh, Kuhnian term, you could say that neuroscience is still in the pre-paradigm state. Yeah. Um, that they don't have uh, any kind of unifying uh, theory or even a set of agreed upon assumptions exactly. for understanding uh, cognitive processes, um, you know, perception and memory and so forth, let alone... Uh, let alone consciousness. It's yeah. like you've got a lot of fragmentary uh, mini theories and hypotheses and a and a virtually infinite amount of data from all scales of the brain. Yeah. But it's it hasn't been organized into a unified whole. And yeah. so I actually argued that it was very premature to have these gigantic projects. Um, but uh, and that it's and that ultimately. Um, you know, this could harm the reputation of neuroscience if you get these, all with all this fanfare, the announcement of these big new initiatives, billions of dollars being funneled um, into, uh, into brain research, when there's a very good possibility, I think overwhelming possibility, that at the end of 10 years, you're not going to have a lot to show for it. On the other hand, you could, use you, get there? The <laughs> yeah, you could use the same argument to say, that's why we need all this money. Yeah, That's why right, we need this right. great organized yeah. project. Yeah. And I get that. Um, on the other hand, it's not a, it, it's not, it's a, it, in some sense, it's a zero sum game. So if you're funneling all the yeah. money into this one, um, 
this one big project that is defined by all these various people who got in at the beginning and are, yeah. and are you know, getting all the uh, money and controlling where it goes, it's possible that it could be funneling the money uh, toward um, ideas that will turn out to be dead ends yeah. and that it might actually be better for the field to remain fragmentary at this point. So you get that astonishing breakthrough like you got right. with this little tiny team of yeah. Watson and Crick <laughs> with uh, Wilkins and, uh, and yeah. Russell and Franklin that led to this enormous breakthrough that then in a very logical way led to the um, cracking mm -hmm. of the genetic code and the human, human genome project. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, it's the whole, it's the argument in general against these huge mega science projects. Yeah. You know, like, like that recent thing that, you know, we talked about a few months ago with the ENCODE project, mm -hmm. where, uh, um, yeah, and, and then w w when it was done, you know, obviously you have a lot of really valuable data, but it was, seems like it was immediately over and misinterpreted by, you know, or, or mispromoted or presented by the same people who were in charge of the project, or there were many accusations that way. Well, I, I worry that, I mean, so I wrote this post originally for Scientific American comparing this big new initiative to the decade of the brain back in the 90s. Oh, yeah, I read that, the decade of the brain, yeah. It was, it was just a big public relations right. stunt, and uh, there were some big shot neuroscientists, including the Nobel laureate Torsten uh, Weisel, I think yeah. his name is. Yeah, Weisel, yeah. who know. thought it was a really dumb idea, and he thought it would actually uh, be um, harmful uh, to neuroscience. But Yeah, I don't think it's hurt. But, well, I, I was just going to point out, since I wrote that piece, there have been a couple of other things that suggests to me that neuroscience might be going through a really rough phase that really harms its credibility. So, one, there was a paper that came out in, uh, in um, what was it, uh, Nature Neuroscience, I think it was, by uh, a bunch of authors, including John Ioannidis, mm -hmm. who was this epidemiologist right. who has been publishing a series of uh, really earth-shaking yeah. papers on the crappiness of the scientific peer-reviewed literature. Yeah, we've talked about him. He's amazing. Yeah. yeah, and so he's focusing on neuroscience and 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 pointing out that many, many neuroscience studies are uh, based on um, statistically very few samples, and so you would expect lousy statistical yeah. uh, significance. There was another piece that just came out today. It was published by, it was a, a kind of op-ed piece published by Cerebrum, mm -hmm. which is the journal of the Dana Foundation for Brain Research. Yeah. This is a guy named Stephen Lisberger from Duke. He's editor. He's a real big shot. He's editor of the journal uh, Neuroscience. And he's saying that he thinks that um, there might be rampant fraud and uh, outright fraud, as well as mm. uh, bias, um, exaggeration of uh, uh, significance of results in the neuroscientific literature, and he really thinks that neuroscientists need to get together and start policing themselves. So wow, I'll um, have to read that. I mean, certainly there's a lot of overinterpretation, but to say outright fraud—that's a huge. Well, he says he's basing this on uh, a study that came out recently that found that the, uh, the number of retractions over the last decade has increased. Uh, oh, in every field. Yeah. And, uh, and he thinks that um, neuroscience, if you really scrutinize it, might turn out to have, uh, you know, fraud is um, a very specific term, and it's, sometimes it's hard to know when it's fraud or when it's just a case of kind of gross confirmation bias. Well, yeah, there's misconduct, and then fraud is a, is a particularly nasty subset of scientific misconduct. Right. And then again, you get into the whole intentionality issue, you know. Right. Like, like, like bias confirmation, you're not intentionally, you know, but, it's, you know, you're over-interpreting, but... Uh, 
then, then there's actually doctoring your data or making it up. Well, he's as a backdrop, he talks about how ferocious the competition for grants yeah. has become in neuroscience. I think, I'm not sure how old this guy is. I think he looks like he's about 50 maybe. Mm. And he says that um, uh, he thinks that he probably couldn't have succeeded in neuroscience uh, as it is now yeah. because the, uh, the fighting has become so intense wow. uh, for attention and grants and tenure and all those sorts of things. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and that's the backdrop of a lot of fields. And, and um, uh, yeah, no. Carl Zimmer has, been, has done some interesting writing about that. There was a piece, oh, well, it was a few months ago in the Times, just you know, about the significant number, uh, a significant increase in the number of retractions for various reasons. Right. Yeah, in scientific journals. And, you know, part of it's just you know, the huge volume of science going on now. Uh, yes. Um, so you combine that with... Uh, the competition with yeah. the either stagnant or actually uh, decreasing um, amount of um, funding yeah. from either foundations or, yeah. uh, or governments for uh, for research. Um, right, and that and being uh, supplemented or replaced by corporate corporate grants. And, right. Yeah. And neuroscience, something I'm worried about is that the uh, the Pentagon is is actually becoming a major supporter of yeah. neuroscience research. Yeah. I mean, they have been for a long time, DARPA, yes. Defense Advanced Research Projects Agency. And they, you know, they, they've long had a reputation for, for financing really, really basic level research, you know, that's you know, far, far beyond what you can imagine having practical implications. But, yeah, then there is that whole... Uh, what do they call it? The uh, the battlefield, the uh, simulated battlefield. Well, there's another term for it. Um, but yeah, you know where you're using you know, neural implants or, or mm -hmm. uh, you know, brain modifications or you know either pharmaceutical or or surgical to uh, you know enhance attention, you know, and cognitive abilities to you know, make more more uh, effective soldiers and. The Terminator is coming, scary. George. <laughs> oh, what a world. <laughs> anyway, I don't know. Should we? Yeah, I guess we're getting near an hour here. Yeah. Uh, listen, um, uh, I, you know, but I, I, I still think, I've said for a while, I think neuroscience is the most exciting field. Yeah. In science, uh, the greatest potential for either for both practical and, and intellectually, philosophically profound advances, but... Um, Huge frontier. We have no way of knowing, like, something like really being able to have a theory that you could point to and say that, oh, yeah, that's what consciousness is. Yeah, I... You in know, in the same the, way you can say, oh, yeah, that's how a gene works. I mean, will that ever happen? And if it does, will it be 10 years or 100 or more? Right. You know, in my... In my uh, Scientific American Post, I say that uh, scientists, brain scientists are looking, some of them hope that they can find a, a neural code uh, yeah. which would be kind of the software, uh, the operating system for the brain that right. is in some sense analogous to the genetic code. But at this point, if there is a neural code uh, that is in any way like uh, the uh, machine uh, machine code of a computer or the genetic code, we have no idea what it is. No, no. So, yeah. the brain is still mysterious. You know, Crick did admit to me uh, a couple of different times that in the long run, the Mysterians might turn out to be <laughs> right. So, the Mysterians right. was the name that... Um, oh, Colin I, again. I, I, yeah, it? I... I think it was actually Owen Flanagan. Who Owen Flanagan, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, he coined the term, and then McGinn and some others uh, popularized it. Uh, borrowed from the old rock group, question mark. Question mark and Mysterians. And the Mysterians were the ones that saying that uh, that the brain, there's, some, there's something spooky going on that's beyond science. Yeah, that the mind-body problem, which 
Socrates worried about, um, will never be solved. Well, yeah, and then, and then there's people who take it to a different level, like uh, we talked about David Chalmers, the philosopher, that maybe mind is some kind of basic, has to be admitted as some kind of basic, you know, fundamental thing in the universe, like mass and energy, and then you get into this whole, you know, panpsychism, where maybe everything has some level of, of mind or consciousness, and which is obviously way beyond anything currently in science or foreseeable. I know Crick would have hated that idea. Oh, a yeah. Consequence, <laughs> a consequence of Chalmers' uh, original formulation of his idea, at least, was that toaster ovens are conscious. And I have a toaster oven, and I can tell you, it's just, there's nothing, there is nothing that it is like to be a toaster oven. <laughs> if that's, if that's, if, yeah, if that's to, to use Nagel's. Nagel's criteria definitely doesn't cut it, but I think, I think Chalmers would, I, I, maybe I'm totally misunderstanding him, but even rock would have you know, some of these little psychons in it, you know, along with photons and electrons, and, but I may be reading too much into that, but um, yeah, yeah well, you know, I certainly LSD beyond, <laughs> I took beyond the LSD the once, in that, and, and I definitely believed in panpsychism. Uh, until I came down. Yeah. yeah well, yeah. That could go either way as far as... Yeah. So. Okay, man. Uh, great talking to you again. And maybe, uh, I don't know, late May or early June, we can talk again. Sounds good. Sometime next month. Okay. Okay, John. Okay, thanks. <laughs>